What sort of feminism should I support? The one that poses you the greatest challenge. As a young feminist, I said some ridiculous things. You must have come across some right plonkers in your time. I've been a right plonker as well. Hello, I'm Julie Bindle, and this is Action Men, a series in which I have interesting conversations with men that actually get up off their backsides and contribute to the work that feminists are doing to prevent rape, domestic violence, and challenge pornography and the sex trade. Today, I'm speaking with Michael Conroy. Michael set up Men at Work. Men at Work is an organisation that looks at macho culture, that looks at the way that boys are encouraged to fight, to compete, and to be abusive towards girls, and in later life, women. Michael, many people think I'm a man-hater. Do you think I'm a man-hater? Um, if you are, you're not a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's said about feminists, but I think me in particular, because I talk about male violence. Yeah. Uh, well, male violence is, uh, is one of the, well, it's probably the biggest problem in the world. Um, uh, and we have to talk about it. Uh, women have to talk about it because it's your experience and men have to talk about it because it's our experience as both victims and perpetrators. Uh, whereas overwhelmingly women are only the victims. Not to say they can't be, but overwhelmingly we have to look at reality. And the reality is that uh, male violence is probably human's problem number one. I agree with you. But I'm interested in why you want to make your life more difficult. Because you could swan through life man, privilege, I hate that word, but we all know what we mean. Mm. But you put yourself on the front line and you decide to tackle this massive issue. Tell me about the work you do with boys and with men. Uh, well, it's, it's dialogue based. I train uh, now, uh, I train teachers and youth workers and whoever works with boys and young men as part of their professional role but also volunteers and increasingly foster families as well, which is really interesting and makes a lot of sense because they spend a lot of maybe 20, 30 years kind of bringing up young men. So it was something that I would never have imagined at the outset, but makes a lot of sense. I've done some work recently with various fostering agencies and I think we'll be doing more. Uh, it's essentially to try and give support to those adults who work with boys and young men uh, to support them in being confident that they can have conversations with them about developing a resilience to negative messaging from culture, whether it's through porn or through porn and the hinterland of porn, which I would include gaming in that to some extent, um, because these things kind of wash across each other and the way the algorithms work is kind of a, it's a very, it's a, like the Gordian knot, isn't it? It's a perfect storm, it isn't it? It, it is. It is. When, well, sometimes I ask teachers or youth workers, what would you say is a typical shift a 15-year-old boy might put in online gaming? 30, 40 hours a week, maybe more in the holidays. That's more than they spend in class. So you, you kind of, it, it kind of contextualizes that what is in that, whether it's porn or gaming or both, or a kind of a kind of a pornified version of game, you know, um, what is in it? What's the message about it? So the work that I do is to give those professionals who know those boys and young men over time the tools to have challenging conversations, which are non-accusatory and not intended to be inflammatory. One week recently, on Monday, I was in a very famous public school. And the day after, I was in a pupil referral unit in Lancashire. And the day after, I was in the biggest state secondary in England. And every day was wildly different. But they were also extremely similar. Right. Because it's what are we telling our boys? What are our boys being invited to articulate in culture? So on one day, when I'm working with a state school or a pro, for example, the conversation is about county lines and misogyny and then why they mix and what is it what is it that makes a 14 15 year old boy vulnerable what is it he doesn't feel he's got that he should have and these notions of what you should have an entitlement uh, are really interesting because uh, some very well-known bad faith actors on tiktok and instagram one of whom is uh 
often in the that press. Unmentionable. In, yeah, yep. currently based uh, in Romania. Um, he's the expertise there, and t you know, sadly, there is a form of expertise. The ideas are nothing new, but it's appealing to an in, uh, an induced sense of grievance slash entitlement in young men, which if if you're led to believe you should be there, but you're there, and that's where you should be, and that's fine. You're going to keep looking up at it and you're thinking, why am I not there? Yeah. Why have I not got that? And and voices going, well, you should have, you should have. Somebody, somebody's stopping you. That's, you know, then you open up conversation with the whole incel nonsense and madness where your entitlement is false. That's it. That's the starting premise. You've been fed wrong information. And those boys that have that sense of entitlement grow into men that think they're entitled to control yeah. their female partners. And if they're out of control... Maybe give them a backhander every now and again. For sure, if they if they feel the need to. But the experts, of course, don't leave any marks. You know, they're, they're just uh, it's all head games, isn't it? To come back to, I think what what you're asking is is why do you make your life more difficult? I think I'm trying to make it clearer to myself personally, but also because I would feel pretty ashamed of myself not to be as active as I possibly could. And is that because you saw something, experienced something? Was there a light bulb moment where you then couldn't get back from? Because as a feminist, that's what happened to me. Mm. Something happened. I saw something. I was in Yorkshire at the time of the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper. I was 17, 18 when things dawned on me that, my God, the world is full of misogyny. What happened to you? It's funny you should mention those murders up in Yorkshire. Uh, um because as a child in Bolton, even though we weren't fully in, there were roadblocks. And my uncle at the time was uh, checked twice because he worked in Leeds. So it was something that I, I felt un, un, unusually kind of scared of, even as a, as a boy. It, it, was a, it was a strange thing because I was kind of coming to terms with what men can do, I suppose. Uh, and there were, there were lots, there's a whole menagerie of these horrendous characters out there. Uh, um, on the news and uh, in the newspapers, etc. So, on, so just just riffing on really what you were saying there about that time, I think it was a bit of a wake up call, also to other men who I, I've spoken to of the similar age that, that we kind of realised what men are capable of in a sense. Strange that it should be that man whose name I'm not going <laughs> to publicise, but. Uh, uh, it, it sort of hit home, and that's, an, that's a strange thing to reflect on now. Uh, but in terms of light bulb moments, um, no, I've not. I've, I've had, when we were kids, we had some, we had the very exciting, uh, we put strip lighting in our living room, and it didn't really work. So it was always like, this works in this room. Strip lighting in your living room. Yeah. Whose idea was that? I think it seemed like a good idea at the time. It was about about the time that Quiche hit Bolton. <laughs> so the start off <laughs> anyway. Uh but it was strip light at the start of when never really worked for it. It was like a lot of false starts. So I'm thinking instead of our light bulb moment, it's more like a very like right. a mile long strip light that kind of keeps starting, flickering, not really knowing what to do. I, I, it reminds me a little bit of this guy, Paolo Freire in Brazil who writes about levels of consciousness, and that's something that kind of underpins some of the DV perpetrator work that I do uh, in association with Women's Aid, actually, up in Manchester, Pankhurst Trust. Um, and it's the idea that you don't just suddenly become conscious. You, you go through a process of having an inkling of feeling uncomfortable, retreating from it because you don't like the discomfort, but knowing that you have to keep going, so it's that kind of to and fro, like the waves on the shore, rather than a single directional linear movement. And I think that uh, is a fairly good descriptor, really, about the feelings of, uh, you know, like loyalty to friendships that you just can't have anymore. Um, things you wouldn't might have turned blind eye to in the past or participated in, you just can't or don't because they're just wrong. They just they're not you anymore. They know all that kind of stuff. Um, but never thinking that there's a destination that you've arrived at. It's just a constant movement and, um, okay, and it oscillates a little bit. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about class and thinking about stereotypes as well of anti-sexist or pro-feminist 
men and I don't know what term you would use for yourself but we can definitely come to that but when I first came across men that were telling us that they were wanting to be part of the women's liberation movement do some good contribute to our efforts it was in the very early 80s and I was still in my teens at that time I was in Leeds I was at a conference against pornography and violence against women and the creche was run by men and there were some women saying we can't have men around kids they're not safe which obviously we know that to be true but we also know that to be quite quite an extreme position effectively what we're saying is you can never have men around kids so it seemed to me a very bleak outlook yeah and then at the same time there were these men and some of them will have been genuine but what i picked up on was men posturing yeah doing the childcare helping the women yeah. when in fact it was their job being what we called nigel that that was our word that was our name for for these men and they had at the time a magazine called achilles heel it was full of very middle class men on a therapeutic road right yeah in other words you know my penis resembles a flower uh, my mother was horrible to me so i'm a kind of faint hearted victim of the patriarchy and then the odd one that would say things like rape is terrible and it's men's responsibility to do something about it. So it was a mishmash, but I found them all to be extremely middle class. Yeah. And and very bookish. So they'd learned feminism through books. Yeah. Whereas I'd learned feminism through doing. And obviously we're calling this series Action Men because for me, you have no right to claim that you're part of any political movement unless you're doing action yeah thinking isn't enough tell me what you experience about the stereotypes you must have come across mm -hmm. the right plonkers in your time doing the work that you do i've been a right plonker as well <laughs> so i have a an, a an atom of sympathy for them um uh yes yeah yes i have i've got a red flag comes up if any man calls himself a feminist because but I do know some good men who have done that and said it in public and been slated for it, rightly, with this part of my brain, rightly. But I'm thinking, what's what now, though? Yeah. What's the aftercare? What can I do? So I try and... And how do we keep him on track yeah. as well? Just because yeah. he, he slipped up, how do we still keep him? Yeah, because I think some of them come to it from the point that feminism isn't a dirty word. It's a good thing. Therefore, I should support it. Therefore, I'm going to put my name to it and not have the thought process of, actually, who's is this thing? So it's not ours. And I think if any if any men are watching this who are in that space, I would just um, put it this way, really, is if we cannot hear the women who say feminism is ours and it's not yours, then if we continue to say that I am that or I'm part of it, then that is an aggressive act. An abusive act. So that's one thing, and I grapple with this all the time, because, of course, the other side of that is the genuine man who uses language that irritates some women, yeah. but it doesn't mean we then cut our ties or condemn him to the point of where he's out of the movement. As a young feminist, I said some ridiculous things, and I wasn't cast asunder, um, and I stayed in the movement because we support each other and what does it matter? It's, it, it's, you know, sometimes it's a word, sometimes it's an attitude, which is more problematic. Yeah. But here's the thing that I want to know from a man that does this work. How do you distinguish between actual feminists, those that are genuinely working to end patriarchy, end male violence, liberate women and live in a truly egalitarian society, and I would put myself in that camp, and those absolute plonkers that masquerade as feminists. It used to be that no one wanted to be called a feminist, and now everybody claims it, but they're saying, for example, Beyonce's a feminist because she's a strong woman and she's done well for herself, or someone's a feminist because they fight for the rights of women to do sex work and stripping or someone's a real feminist because they 
speak for all women, including women with penises, so trans women. How, when you're actually amongst women and we're saying to you, Michael, for God's sake, help us out with this project. There's these blokes that really need talking to, there's these boys that really need educating about porn. You know, that's that's cool. Yeah. But what about those that call themselves feminists and you know they're anything but? How do you deal with them? Uh, wow, that's a really good question. Obviously, it's extremely politically vexed. If I can slightly reframe it, I'll hopefully answer it in the same by doing so. But if I don't, then do tell me. Um, I've seen a couple of conversations with men, and I've had conversations with men occasionally behind the scenes, men occasionally meet. Uh, it's all about football and fighting and beer and of things course. like that, yeah. Where are you going to get your next tattoo? Exactly, yeah, that kind of stuff. But we do occasionally, you know, guys in Australia or Canada, we might just occasionally have, have, have uh, meet, meet up and a couple of hours and say, you know, what's the best way we can contribute to this? What are we seeing that's really going wrong with men who we thought were on side, um, et cetera? And I guess the question is, and I have seen it posed clearly on Twitter, for example, or X, whatever it's called these days. <laughs> what sort of feminism should I support? Answer, the one that poses you the greatest challenge. Avoid the ones that don't challenge you at all. Avoid the ones that say that whatever you're doing is fine because you're part of some bogus empowerment or liberation. So if you're being told by women and women are exposed to misogyny as are men and internalize it in different ways because you have a different subjectivity within that that kind of overwhelming paradigm uh women do sometimes say but come in occasionally i've made comments around prostitution and pimping online or in public and they say who are you as a man to tell me that i can't do that so i'm not telling you anything never would never will never have I'm saying to my brothers that if you buy women, you're abusing them. That's it. That's the end of the story. Uh, and if you choose to offer as some kind of uh, reason or justification for that, that some women whose life story and the pressures within which we will never know lead them to say that in public or to you, then th that's your fault. <laughs> That's your accountability. Often I say to the, the young men who I've been working with over the years, why, and men, uh, adult men who I work with now, I start it by saying, why do people believe things? <laughs> it's, it's part of the reason we believe things, because they suit us and they please us and they are in alignment with our habits and our thoughts and, and behaviours. Too right. I mean, tell me a bit about yourself and your political allegiances, if you have any. Describe your position in the world and tell us also about what led you to the work with boys and with men uh yeah politically crikey a bit of a mixed bag uh, i would say traditionally from a labor background uh working class from a little town called horwich near bolton all family uh, my mum was a teacher she was the first educated uh university goer in our family um and but you know, two up, two downs, uh, typical work, Irish Catholic influence, you know, back in the day, up up there in Lancashire. I know, Horwich, a friend of mine was the mayor there. Oh, really? Yeah, it's Chris Root. I guess small yeah, world, isn't it? It's a small world, world it used yeah. used to be a, lo uh, a locomotive town, and, and they used to work yeah. at the local works as a cement finisher back in the day. But um, I, f I find the idea of political parties absurd. I mean, I literally, I, I couldn't do, what's it called, cabinet res collective responsibility? I couldn't do that. I can't, I can't get on uh, with I'm, people. I'm reaching that point. Yeah, I just can't get on with people. <laughs> At, well, well, I, yeah. I'm trying to be nice, but I, I can't possibly say I'm going to agree with this person. I don't know what's going to come out of their mouth. I mean, it just doesn't strike me as yeah. sane. However, I would say uh, broadly uh, socialist, um, and yet, the people who deliver socialism are not always uh, the full ticket. Well, often they're Teach. as misogynistic as the men course, on the right. Of course, it's like, all I want to know is what do you do? What do you do every right. day? What you say is of little or no importance to uh, me at yeah. all. What do you? What are your actions? Where do you put your money? Yeah. Where, uh, where, where do you spend your time? And who do you support? Do you watch porn? Do you watch porn? I think you're asking me for a minute. No is the answer to that. <laughs> uh, not that I haven't in the past, because sure. I know we're born into a world where it's everywhere. Yeah. 
Yeah, not bizarre memories of being 13, 14 at a mate's house up in Bolton and his dad had VHSs and we're just looking at stuff. I think, I'm kind of part of thinking, what the hell am I actually looking at? Uh, oh, what is it? You know, is that, is that uh, sex? But then you you don't see it for months, maybe, or years, or you find a magazine. Like this is going back into the 70s, 80s and 80s, like 70s and 80s. Mate. The old days before smartphones. Yeah, but you find a magazine or in a bush, bizarre stuff like that. But it was like chance encounters. That, and I, I think something that people simply don't understand about porn really is that that world is like the Jurassic period. This is entirely different. It is everywhere. It's within seconds for anybody all the time. And it's now. I mean, the, the porn magazine Playboy that I found under my brother's bed in the 70s is now on our TV screens as just background music. Yeah. And they've got no idea. We we had no idea in those days when I first started campaigning against porn. Even with the infamous cartoon photograph on the cover of Hustler magazine of the woman being pushed through a meat grinder, we had no idea how much worse it was going to get. But tell me... How you approach that with boys? Because you work with boys and you work with male perpetrators of domestic violence, don't you? Let's start on the boys. What do you do with them? Well, that that stems from I spent 16 years working in secondary education in in the Midlands in Worcestershire and sort of South Birmingham area, uh, working across a group of high schools doing things around citizenship, community outreach, charities. It, it was very broad brief. I, I was given a lot of latitude, which was quite lucky because I'm the kind of person who needs it at work um, and I, I was allowed to set up uh, boys uh, conversation groups, support work f- uh, for lads of about 14, 15, 16 up to sixth form, 17, 18 sometimes across a few schools and supported in that by teachers and the reason for that was I think it was about 2015, 2016 uh, we started that was when smartphones were kind of hitting some of the kids, and then the year after, almost all, and then since about 2018 also, it's been everybody, but, but also going into primary. And it just kind of blew everything into school that had been there in drips and drops here and there, but it was what happened once a month was now once a week, or once a week is now every day. And instead of just year 10, it's year 8 and 7, and we're hearing about it at primary. And it, it, it is pornification. We're hearing about porn in primary school. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I've got family who teach in primary. If you've got the device, the only thing that stops, the only thing between a child and porn is safeguarding aware adults. That's all there is. So that you mean adults that understand the actual harm of porn as opposed to doing that shaming and anti-sex and yeah. humiliating, so took, which doesn't work, does it? No, uh, and which is in fact what porn is. Right. That, that kind of orchestrated humiliation in, in right. a way. But it's the, the, the parents and teachers, parents, carers, teachers, whatever that kind of nexus is, the only thing, you can't stop a child accessing the internet. It's just the genie is out of the bottle, it's gone. But what all we can do, therefore, is consciously have really good conversations with all parties involved, which is safeguarding base, which is not moralistic or pointy fingers. That doesn't work. It's just it's about the approach, uh, whether an approach works or not, because it's very easy to jump in with both feet and say, this is awful, it's terrible. And yes, it is, but that doesn't work. It, uh, and we it, have... it doesn't work. And thinking about the way that kids going through puberty or approaching puberty are so mixed up about sex and how girls often, and some boys obviously, but so many girls have, like their first sexual encounter is unwanted. Yeah. And then I hear about kids at school and sometimes girls, young girls, like 12, 13, 14, have come to me when I've done talks in schools and said things are happening to them that they're really unhappy about, that it's say rape, they don't use particular words that are too loaded. Yeah. But nobody's actually had the conversation with them to find out what's going on at home, what's going on in the schoolyard. It's extraordinary because it's such a huge part of of, of our use. It is. It is. And recent reports from, gosh, Ofsted, everyone's invited, the NEU. uh, It seems like a constant cycle of reports that keep telling us these things are happening in our schools. 
and then Ofsted, the government tell Ofsted to make uh, demands of schools, but there's never any resources or training put in place. So there's a, uh, sometimes it's almost like why why do we keep having these reports if there's no pop, if there's no outcome, there's no structural outcome. So this is a very long winded way to say uh, as a result of the 16 years in te- in teaching and. Um, Certainly the latter eight years, up to, say, 2020, when I set up uh, Men at Work, uh, while I was still working in schools, is because you just look and you think there is nothing structural, programmatic at all. There is ad hoc intervention after the fact, Band-Aid, damage is done, spilt yep. milk, you know, all of that stuff. And you're thinking, this, this is not good enough. Uh, and I just started to spend time talking with boys and young men, some of whom I knew had uh, were victims of domestic abuse themselves because they were growing up in those families. Their dads are in prison or or not. Um, usually not. Of yeah, course. usually not for DV, but they might have been for something else. Right. But, but the DV's in the in the picture, and you just you're kind of looking at them, thinking, well, they've got that, they've got porn, they've got what else <laughs> about how to how to develop a compass about how to find their way in life safely for themselves and safely for women and girls and other other lads around them. Because it benefits their lives, doesn't it? And this is what I found when I talked to every single friend of mine in different countries around the world, because as I've said to you, I've got a man in every port. I mean, wherever I travel, um, whether it's Vancouver or Kenya, there's always at least one male friend doing the work that you're doing. I'll get together with him, we'll have a glass of wine or a cup of coffee and we'll have a laugh, yep. and that's another thing about the stereotypes, that we're humorless, us yeah, feminists, yeah, yeah. and you doing the work as almost auxiliaries, you're humorless, yeah, yeah. and not only that, but you're cowed, and, and you, you, you kind of shiver at our feet, and we tell you what to do, and you've got no agency, and you don't think for yourself. And yeah. So, God, imagine going out for dinner with the humorless feminist and the cowed fella. Well, what well. a terrible night that would be. But, but this is what I hear from men everywhere, is that you do this work with boys, they're getting no positive messages at all. They grew up without a positive message. In the main, some of them are feminist mums or pro-feminist dads, but very few. And then you decide to set up men at work. Mm. So what is that? It was, uh, it's a, ultimately, it's a training company for anybody who works with boys or teenage, uh, adolescent, young adult men. It's one of the wonderful things about this work, apart from it's bad that the need drives it, but you just meet people and you think, I don't know about you. I come didn't know there was a, a young young dad's outreach group of nurses in Coventry doing all this amazing stuff that that kind of Venn diagrams with anti gang work also, you know. And you just think, I didn't know that. No, no, but I absolutely and there's so much good stuff. But they wouldn't be calling themselves part of I'm f I'm feminist. They're just doing the work. And that's the thing. It's like, just do the work. That's it. There is no follow on to that. Just do it because it needs to be done. And and the kind of waving the flag and wearing the T-shirt, I think is a, a sign that you don't really understand the importance of the work. Well, if you have to wear a T-shirt to say, this is what a feminist looks like, then seriously, you should be locked in a room for rather a long time with just Love Island and yeah. bread and water, shouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. But it's... What's your relationship with feminists? I mean, how do you see yourself in relationship to the women's movement? Because it must be a bit fraught sometimes. You're doing this work. Sometimes you must be viewed with suspicion sometimes because what bloke wants to put himself out to do this? Yeah. And and, on, and, and that's fine. I understand the suspicion totally. And I've made some wrong moves, certainly. I, I, mean, I joined Twitter on 2015, made some very wrong moves. And <laughs> there you Haven't go. Haven't we all? <laughs> it's, uh, it's all like little insect in amber, isn't it? Like it's there. Uh, um, and I think that's, I think that ties back a bit to what you were saying earlier, Julie, about you were saying that you'd made some comments in your early days. And but, later. But it, yeah, God, heaven for fend. But, um, but that was part of a time which was a much more humane in that we were allowed to survive our true. mistakes. That's and now it's just cut and paste, look, shit, screenshot. It's like, well, uh, I'm not going to bother moving on then. Right. If I'm surrounded by you reminding me no what redemption, I did. No redemption. What's the no point? No understanding. No. It, no learning. No, no. it's so difficult because you understand that people don't want people to get off scot-free, pretend it never happened. But the other, but, but we've got to have a trajectory. You've got to have an arc, otherwise you just 
close down and keep eating things. Sod it. I'll keep doing the same thing. No, yeah, and the, anyway, there's not enough of us, to be honest, that we can afford to just cut somebody out for the slightest digression without an understanding. I, I, I love it when I'm able to say, oh, God, yeah, I was so wrong when I said that, or that, that article, Christ, I wish I hadn't read, written that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, let's move on, shall we? Let's get on with it. And, and this is what you do, isn't it? Because you, you, I, I've seen you say to some men that are doing good work on domestic abuse or whatever, but that might have a position that you and I don't agree with, yeah. perhaps on pornography, perhaps on the sex trade in general. And as Andrea Dworkin once famously said, you know, leftist or progressive men, as they'd be called now, can't have their pornography and their reputation as pro-feminist men. They no, just can't. No. And And I've seen you challenge other men in a way that, does actually allow things to move on, does allow for a relationship to keep going. Surely that's what we need to... I used to be much less forgiving of myself and others. I, but I, no, no, we can't do that. I, I do try to be. Um, and in, in real life, I well, not that Twitter isn't everything is real life, but in the physical realm, yeah. uh, I, I, tr I try to treat others as I would like them to treat me. I've been treated really kindly by people who are saying, mate, you've got that totally wrong. And I've sat down and I thought, shit, I've really got that totally wrong. Okay, thanks. I didn't get it, and now I, I get it, or I kind of understand why, why you've said that. So I'll kind of try and reciprocate, and that's going to be an ongoing process, I think. But um, I was researching the harms of the sex trade in South Africa. It's mainly it's black um, and women of colour, girls that are affected by it, and it's not all, but mainly white, wealthier men perpetrating these abuses and I was preparing for a trip and I had a fixer somebody who was local who could show me around and look after me and you know it's usual journalistic practice a black woman feminist and she said to me whatever you do don't stay in the black areas go to stay in one of the white B&Bs um it's too much crime around there you'll be hassled you'll be bothered and I took that advice went to stay in the white B&B &B, found that they were racist they really were. They had a pool boy, as they called him. They would make comments. I felt really uncomfortable. And at the end of that trip, I thought, why did I just allow myself to take that easy advice off yeah, my fixer, yeah, yeah. who was clearly just seeing white woman who yeah. could afford to stay in the white area. Yeah. And she was doing that because that's not normally what journalists would do. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, why did I just take the easy way out? It was such a wrong decision. And that, that really struck me, actually. Mm. And when we've done it, all you, the best we can do is try and learn from anything, isn't it, really? Just there is, but we also have to have a laugh at the same time. I mean, you know, I can't bear irrev I can't bear those reverential kind of overly earnest people that just think that you have to take a particular perfect line on everything. No. I, I mean, I, I call women birds for a laugh. For a laugh. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll make jokes that come directly out of sexism. Sometimes you'll see people looking at you as if to say, but you're a feminist, how can you talk... That's, I think, probably why we get on, because we're a bit more relaxed about stuff that isn't perhaps life-threatening. Yeah, but just to... I'm not suggesting that you'd laugh about being saying birds. I know no, you no, wouldn't. I, was, I, was I know very, you wouldn't. That, my secret stand-up routine is is to remain secret. <laughs> the Bernard, Bernard Manning homage. Uh, no, I, I, I think um, being poor faced is, you know, it's oh, an it's unfortunate affliction, worse. isn't it, really? Uh, well, I wanted to go out for a drink with a friend of mine. Um, over in Vancouver, a man doing very similar work to you. And he said, oh, you've got to meet my friend. Let's call him Jeff. And uh, Jeff comes out and says, come on, boys, let's go and get a really nice gin martini. And Jeff started telling me about how alcohol was a patriarchal tool and about how it causes violence. And, and I just thought, I just want to go and have a martini, mate. See you, Jeff. I really just want to go and have a drink. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, but then... What the, what's the meaning of that behaviour to him? I'd be fascinated. I, I, I would I would like to go out for a night with Jeff, and I'd hate to go out. But I would fascinated. Kind I think of like, I might interview Jeff for this series, actually. Yeah, yeah, about his theory. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, thank you, Michael, because um, I am so optimistic about actually boys growing up and becoming men that are whole human beings, and you're part of that. So thank you. That's the work. Thank you. 